Welcome back. Time for a little talk at the table, and we begin with a sea change in the corridors of power, or at least golf power. The legendary Augusta National Golf Club, home of the Masters, has turned away women for 80 years, but yesterday we finally got a crack in that glass ceiling. Not one, but two women invited into their club. Former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and South Carolina business executive Darla Moore were both gracious as they broke into the boys club, accepting their membership at Augusta National. It's a club filled with heads of state, CEOs, and America's wealthy. Sports columnist Christine Brennan said that the change was about much more than just sports. This is a huge event. Um, this is not just about playing golf. This is about the corridors of power in our country. The former club chairman, Hootie Johnson, and that's a fun name to say, once told reporters he wouldn't be forced to admit a female member even at, quote, the point of a bayonet. Hootie Johnson is still alive, but what may have changed minds was IBM CEO Virginia Romady. She is the first IBM CEO who has not been let in as a member of Augusta, even though her company actually sponsors the Masters Tournament. And we can certainly applaud uh, the admission of women. But uh, it's first, about time. <laughs> but should clubs, should private clubs have the right to have specific parameters, specific guidelines as to who they want and who they don't want in their clubs? You know, uh, I've long said if men are subject to an activity as boring as golf, women should have to be as well. Uh, I, 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 I think, yes, uh, private clubs should have to uh, apply the same standards to people of all genders, of all races. If it's something you can't control, uh, it's not a political affiliation, it's something that you're born with. Condoleezza Rice was born a woman, uh, Dominic Carter was born a man, uh, they shouldn't be able to discriminate, absolutely not. Well, they started left letting African Americans in in the, I think, 1990. So why did it take so long to let women in? And this really is about the glass ceiling. And it really is about, as Hillary Clinton, I think, was the one that said about shattering that glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. But, but it's a good thing. I mean, this is the year 2012. Why are we still? I'm not saying you can't control who's in your country club. I don't want to be there. But come on. I mean, let some women members Even in. Even the Friars Club, uh, you know, a historically male-dominated private club in, in New York was forced to admit women after Gloria Allred brought suit. It's only right that Augusta do the same thing. Dominic, you mentioned Hillary Clinton and the White House as being one of the glass ceilings that has been cracked but not broken yet. What do you think the other big glass ceilings are that are still left in the country? I mean, we have three women on the Supreme Court. Uh, we've had more women there. They're still vastly underrepresented in Congress. In, in terms of their percentage of the population. Are, is there... Well, politics and business, like predominantly, certainly the finance industry, you're starting to see more of it, but those are traditionally male-dominated uh, businesses and, and institutions, if you will. How about, how about equal pay? Women still get 82% of, of what men get in general. Well, there's different statistics that <laughs> represent that, but I think um, certainly women play a really important role in everything we do. Sports, um, sure. they should be, you know, we have, a, it's a great thing, I think, for young girls growing up as a role model, and I would like to see more of it. For, for every dollar a man earns, a woman should earn that same dollar. The argument is ridiculous. As a matter of fact, one can make a strong argument that they should earn more because in many cases, they're the ones that take care of the families. Ah, but women have a longer life expectancy, so that three or four extra years that they live, they get it back on the back end financially. <laughs> oh, oh, great. Three or four extra years at work. I'm sure, I'm sure they're dancing uh, in the streets. All right, next up, Islamophobic billboards. Check this out. This is a new billboard which is on display at the Metro North train platform in Hartsdale, New York, and Westchester. Source of fresh controversy about the boundaries of free speech. If you can't make it out, it reads, 19,250 deadly Islamic attacks since 9-11. It's not Islamophobia, it's Islamorealism. The ad was paid for by the American Freedom Defense Initiative, the umbrella organization for Stop Islamization of America. That is a group that has been designated by the Southern Poverty Law Center as a hate group. The groups are led by Pamela Geller, who you may remember from the Ground Zero mosque controversy. The MTA, that's where the, the signs are, are being posted, along with its advertising contractor, CBS Outdoor, reviews advertisements to make sure that they comply with the MTA's advertising standards. Two questions here. I think we can all agree that uh, the CBS and, and the MTA certainly had the right to do this. This is, nobody objects to the, to the fact that they have the right to do this. So I'll jump right to the second question. Should they have allowed this ad to go up? Does that, is anybody troubled by the content of this ad enough? 
Well, I, I mean, I think there's a legitimate debate about uh, the merits of the ad and the merits of this uh, particular group. There's plenty of folks that don't think it's a hate group, and I'm sure there's fatwas being issued against me right now. But m I'm a big believer in the First Amendment and free speech. If you don't like what the ad says, you don't have to look at it. Uh, I am a, a believer that the solution to free to speech that you don't like is more free speech. I would love to see CARE or some uh, pro-Islamic groups take out ads uh, right across the street, uh, advertising what they think is their point of view. Absolutely, the ads should I, be I, I agree with you to a degree, but there has to be some corporate responsibility. And that type of ad, in my opinion, leads to more hate, to division. It leads to possibly attacks on, on Muslim Americans mm -hmm. and certainly a divisiveness. And I don't think it, it helps us much. Well, I don't think you can hold the ad directly responsible for attacks, but I agree with what Frank was saying. And where's the line? If you start saying it about one topic, you know, it can become a very slippery slope. And I don't think that the MTA, it, it's, if it's privately owned, they have a right to decide what they want to do. But if they're proponents of true free speech, then they should allow anyone, you know, as long as it's not... Right. Uh, Plus, at a time when I'm paying two fifty for a subway ride, they're <laughs> desperate for revenue. They should be taking every ad they can get, in my view. <laughs> what about fact-checking? I mean, the, the 19,000 number may be taken a little bit out of proportion. I, th I think it includes overseas attacks. It includes things like in Iraq, where you have, you know, Muslims and fighting Muslims, so you're going to wind up with uh, Islamic attacks. It should, should companies like CBS, or in this case, uh, the MTA be responsible for fact checking and for no, uh, no, no more than uh, the advertisers on this station. RNN is not going to go and check every single fact of every ad that they run. Uh, the the advertiser is responsible for the content of their ad, whether it's on television, radio, or in a billboard. It's not up to CBS or the MTA to look into the facts of what they write. Let me extend that further. What about political ads? Because there w there are plenty of examples over the years where television stations, radio stations do not allow ads or pull ads because they don't think they ring factually true. Should there be a responsibility f to the broadcasters or to the people who, are, who own the billboard or, or whatever it may be? Uh, f about the truthfulness or the, or the fact checking the ads? Well, certainly with political ads, a lot of stuff is up to interpretation. And like you just said, where did they get their stats from? Did they include overseas attacks? Why couldn't they include overseas attacks if they wanted to make that part of the statistics? I mean, like you said, there's no way that you can get in the business of fact checking every ad. That's why they have independent websites, you know. Uh, factchecker.com that uh, uh, analyzes each side's ads to say what's true and what's in, false. In terms of politics, the slippery slope, I think, though, is these independent groups. Not ads from any particular candidates where they proudly say they approve this message, but it's ads that are from one group with a certain agenda disguised as another group. There was uh, an ad running today, a pro uh, Claire McCaskill ad in Missouri mm -hmm. attacking Todd Akin, but it was made to look like it was an ad from a conservative group. That sort of deceptive advertising has no place in uh, in the media or in politics, in my view. But of course, that happens every single day, every single race, all the way through. All right, uh, we're going to take another quick break here on RFL. We'll wrap up the show when we return. <laughs>